Welcome to the Docs Who Lift podcast, where we distill and simplify the complexities of a healthy lifestyle, exercise, medicine, and weight loss. We're excited to bring you a podcast that's a prescription for clinical practice, scientific recommendations, and just real life. This this is the Docs Who Lift podcast. Hey, and welcome back to the Docs Who Lift podcast. I'm your host, Dr. Spencer Nadolski. I got my co-host, Dr. Carl Nadolski Jr. Really? And with us today, we got a few special guests, Dr. Kathleen Keller, uh, a scientist at Penn State. We are Penn State. We are. <laughs> Yasha Droja, uh, who's going to be going to medical school next year. Um, and we wanted to have a great conversation with Dr. Keller and Yash, uh, because Dr. Keller studies uh, basically, the the eating behaviors and neural mechanisms uh, of taste preferences uh, in kids, food marketing and all that type of stuff, and we didn't want to seem like we're just straight up big pharma shills giving everybody drugs in the water. We we do like to talk about how to prevent uh, obesity before it occurs and all the pathophysiology anyway of how it does occur. So, welcome, Doctor Doctor Keller and Yash. It's a pleasure. Thank you so much for having us on today. Yeah, thank you for having me on. Pleasure. Yeah, I'd like to go into like your how'd you get into this research? Like it's a cool, it's a cool field. It's and it's uh needs to be done, but like how did you get into this? Well, I was al- always a foodie and I uh I originally, you know, wanted to go to medical school, you know, like like Yash, but I um was really interested in food and nutrition and kids and sort of didn't know how to combine these areas. And I've always been really fascinated with with cooking, and you know, inevitably, when you try to really create a, a magical dish for for everybody, there's somebody at the table who doesn't like it, who's not going to eat it. And I was just always really fascinated by why we have these very different reactions to food, and why it's so difficult to get, particularly kids, sometimes to eat, you know, the the foods that we really think are. Mm-hmm healthy, like fruits and vegetables sometimes can be a little bit challenging, particularly vegetables. So I um, started out studying really genetics um, and how that affects the ability to taste bitter. And we were able to, you know, characterize some um, genetic differences in kids that resulted in differences in their liking of things like broccoli and um, other, other types of vegetables. Um, and that sort of morphed into what I'm doing now. When I came to Penn State, there was an opportunity. They had just gotten a, a, a magnetic an MRI machine, and they wanted to recruit some people to use it. And I had never done MRI before, but they were willing to give me a lot of training and, and you know, hook me up, up with some some specialists who had who had done um, you know that type of research. And so now um, the the work that we're really doing is is trying to understand how children's brains respond to food cues, in particular things like food marketing, food commercials, um, pictures of of food that is in really large portion size. You know, how do those types of of food cues influence kids, and you know, what types of behaviors do they display? And then can we you know make connections between what their brain looks like when they're seen? these types of cues and what their actual behavior is in, in the lab. That's awesome. Can you, for, for everyone out there, because, you know, we've, we've been fascinated with like functional MRIs and how this is a, you know, there's so much uh, brain disease component of obesity and metabolic disorders, but it's beyond our, I guess, uh, expertise to be able to explain it and articulate it well to other people. So could you tell people what that exactly means? And I mean, you know, kind of based on, I mean, obviously lots of different people are doing different types of functional MRI studies and we look at those and, and say, wow, this is awesome. And this is how complicated the disease is. And this is where we're working on. But beyond that, it's, it's hard to explain it to people for us. So if you could give people a little background as to where, where that science has come from and, and what does it even mean? What does it all mean, Basil? Yeah, um, it's a great question because we all have seen those brain pictures of the pretty brain with the colored blobs on them, you know. But what does that really mean for behavior? Um, so that when you do functional MRI, you're actually measuring differences in blood flow in the brain, and this, you know, came out of the cognitive neuroscience field, and um, a lot of what we do when we're studying differences in eating behavior in 
the MRI context is that we are setting up different conditions and um, expecting to change blood flow in the brain, which is a correlate for your neurons firing. So we think it's a correlate for activity in the brain. Um, but we, in the case of our lab, we have children um, view different types of food conditions. And so sometimes they might be, you know, watching a, a fast food commercial um, and we'll be showing them that to them, you know, in the MRI. And then we might show them some pictures of, of different types of foods, maybe some healthy foods, maybe some foods that aren't so healthy. Um, and then we'll usually have, you know, some control conditions. Um, in the case of our studies, we've used, um, could be you know, pictures of, of other types of images like office supplies, something that isn't very you know, rewarding. Or in the case of our advertising work, we're actually comparing how children's brains respond when they see food commercials and how they respond when they see um, commercials for other types of things like toys. Um, and then when we look at their responses, we actually are looking at a, a what's called a contrast map, which is the difference in activation in their brain when they're seeing food commercials minus the difference in the activation in their brain when they're seeing the control condition. Um, and so some of the things that we've been able to show from that are, you know, when we show kids food commercials, we see a decreased activation in a part of their brain called the prefrontal cortex, which is the part of big part of your brain up front that is really important for decision making and for being able to make decisions about, you know, healthy foods to eat, when to stop eating, when you've had enough. Um, and so we suspect that, you know, one of the reasons that food marketing is so uh, such a potent stimulus is that it may be reducing your ability to make decisions or making you more impulsive. And so that's one of the basically bypasses it. Yes. Yeah. Bypasses your decision. So I talk to patients about this all the time when we're talking about I see adults, well, Spencer mostly too, I think. And and you know, we talk about obesity and, and the different types of symptoms they have, whether it's hunger, lack of satiety, but a lot of the cravings. And when they're trying so hard, they they know what to do. And I say, yeah, it's all those different, you know, hormones we have communicating with your brain and it overrides the front part of your brain that's trying to make executive decisions, but it's just, it's really hard. And so that's kind of what you're just saying, huh? Have you looked into the genetics then? Are some people like, oh, they're, they're clearly completely bypassing it. Like, yeah. is that part of what you've done or no, not yet? Yeah. And our, and our different kids, obviously different, uh, the responding differently because we know there's so many different genetic predispositions mm -hmm. and whatnot. Yeah. Great questions. In our lab, we haven't um, done the genetic test yet, but one of my um, colleagues at Dartmouth, her name is um, uh, Diane Gilbert Diamond, and she has looked at the FTO gene, which is um, a gene that you probably maybe talked about on the podcast, maybe not, but it's a gene that influences their common risk for obesity. Um, and children who have this at-risk version of the FTO gene, which is relatively common, I think about 20 to 30% of kids have it, um, they have an even increased um, response in the reward parts of their brain when they see the seafood marketing. Um, and so in our, our lab, we're actually really interested in the resilience factor. We, we also look at risk, but we're particularly interested in why some, some children, when they're in an environment that is, has a lot of different biological risk and also environmental risk, there are still some children who are able to maintain a healthy weight. And we're trying to find out what it is about those children. Is it biology? Is it parenting? Is it um, executive functioning? You know, different types of characteristics we're looking at um, to characterize, you know, what what it is about some children that. What What have you found out? So um, we're midway through this study yet, but one of the things that we've been particularly interested in, so we're interested in two things that we think might be good indicators. Um, one that seems to protect you from overeating in some circumstances is executive functioning, which is a, a series of cognitive processes, inhibitory control, um, working memory, and um, they're really processes that are determined by your prefrontal cortical action. And so they're exactly the processes that 
when we looked at food advertising, that was what food advertising was really reducing is your ability to um, function in your, your prefrontal cortex. Um, but we think when you, for children who have, you know, increased executive functioning, they seem to be better at regulating themselves in some of the eating behavior tests that, that we set up. Um, the other thing that we don't have a lot of data on, but we are, well, we have data, but we, it's not published data, but we're very interested in interoceptive processing, which is your body's ability to detect signals of hunger, or fullness, pain. Um, it is really um, controlled by a couple areas of the brain, the cerebellum and the insula. But we, one of the reasons we're very interested in this is because with kids, we tell parents to feed responsibly, to, to make sure that you're paying attention to your child's hunger and fullness cues and feed them when they're hungry and stop feeding them when they're full. But we know that there are kids from the time that they're born that are always hungry, that even from the time they're breastfed, they're sucking very vigorously at the breast, they're crying, even though the, the parent is breastfeeding them, they're frequently crying to be fed. Um, so those children have biologically a very high appetite. And there's a, you know, I think it's a debate as to how best to feed a child responsibly if they're legitimately always hungry. Um, and so that's one of the reasons why we're interested in getting to the, the bottom of whether, you know, kids who report being hungry all the time, are they, is it a, is it coming from the gut or is it coming from the brain or the ability to process the food together? And we've talked a lot about on our podcast about some of the very specific monogenic severe syndromic causes of obesity that, I mean, that's a whole extreme on that spectrum that you're talking about, but I don't know if you, have you had any of those patients? I mean, they're relatively rare, but um, that, that, that really, really, really are always hungry and food seeking from, mm -hmm. from birth, basically. This, the work we've been doing recently has actually been in um, kids who are all without obesity. So they're actually healthy weight at baseline and we follow mm -hmm. them. They vary by parental obesity status. So we follow them over time. So we haven't done any of the work in the kids with the monogenic um, gene defects. Um, and as you said, they are rare. And so more of the kids we see probably have a number of different gene defects that are or gene alterations that maybe contribute a small amount to appetite, um, but they're not as severe as some of the, the single gene yeah, you were going to say something. What were you going to say? And as a research assistant, um, speaking on what uh, Dr. Keller was talking about, we do um, in our studies after the test meal, a lot of times we follow it up with what we call EAH, which stands for eating in the absence of hunger paradigm. So that's basically mm -hmm. those types of foods. It's served on a, on a big plate and you got all sorts of bright foods such as like Starburst, Skittles, ultra processed foods, ice cream, pretzels. So foods mm -hmm. that typically after you would eat a test meal, you like we use visual log analog scales, so basically rating how full these kids feel. And a lot of the time, when I conduct these studies in person, I see that the kids report being full. But then once we go on to see the EAH paradigm, which lasts for ten minutes, you got all these yummy foods in front of them that are very energy dense, and the kids yeah. tend to eat them still, even though report being full. And you know that can contribute to the energy balance equation and whatnot. So it's very interesting, and these foods are ubiquitous in our environment. I think if anybody's listening, they, they should probably intuitively know this. If they go to birthday parties and you see various kids, various sizes, and s some kids will, you know, if, if it's cupcakes, they might eat a half of a cupcake and they're like, I'm full. Other kids will eat a couple cupcakes and be like, I could have another one. I don't know. So it's just really interesting. And I don't think we figured it out yet, but I'm really excited. You guys are looking at this. And, and, and some people, and again, there's so much more complexity to it. Some people can, you know, kind of get away with yeah. it based upon other factors of their energy balance system. I mean, you know, I think, you know, we think about our own kids, you know, and we, we kind of joke around, but there's a lot of truth and problem to it when we say, well, there's always room for ice cream, right? Yeah. You know, and I mean, you know, Spencer and I have little kids and, you know, they don't always finish their healthy food, but man, we offer ice cream. It's gone but sometimes they're like okay that's about yeah right. not all the time they'll they'll eat a half of the ice cream thing and i'm like really 
Right. They okay. might not eat the whole thing. And it depends. I mean, I, you know, I think that they, they work out a lot too. So, you know, so I make my kids like, you know, little protein ice cream shakes on the days they work out and they almost always finish those, but they're, they're definitely hungrier. And then of course, if, if my work colleagues put a thing of peanut M&Ms in front of me, I have to have them hide it from me. Otherwise I'll eat the whole thing. Yeah. One of our uh, colleagues at Penn State, Barbara Rolls, uh, actually um, like did a whole video about that, but that sensory specific satiety basically talks about how whenever food um, palatability or texture changes, such as like when ice cream is presented, you still have room for dessert, right? So, um, mm-hmm. and you know, food marketers and all that, all those people are really good at doing that because their job is to design really yummy food that, you know, consumers are going to buy. Can you go more into the sensory specific satiety? We've talked about it before, but I think it's really important for people to know. Um, and you just intuitively talked about it, but just a little bit more about that. Yeah. So uh, again, like I said, different foods have different textures, palatabilities, tastes, and that triggers um, different parts of our brain, like the striatum prefrontal cortex, among many other things. And it involves a lot of, uh, it implicates different ways we can regulate energy intake. So like, let's say you have a protein rich meal, like lean chicken, veggies and whatnot, and you might report being full, but afterwards, whenever you're presented something like you know, similar to our EAH foods, you got different textures, palatability, salty, sweet, that can really, um, you know, trigger different neurological reactions in kids. And as a result of that, you know, increase energy intake subsequently, and it just contributes to, you know, an issue that we have like chronic energy intake, you know, some people I think will say energy toxicity, but all this energy extra, all this extra energy intake, you know, can result in excess adiposity, which we see in um, DEXA scans that we also perform on the kids. So, you know, so, so what's interesting though, is that some people, even when presented this food, they're like, nah, I'm good. And that's right. kind of what you guys are studying. Is that right? Yeah. It could, yeah, it could be with, um, we do this thing called the NIH toolbox, which measures working memory in kids. And, uh, Dr. Keller was talking about it just now, but those who maybe tend to perform better on that and have better working memory might be more resilient to the effects of advertisement or foods. And, can better regulate food intake. So we're still working on that data, but it's a hypothesis, right? So the real question is, how do we make the goldfish that kids love? (laughs) Like, how do we make broccoli the same? Like people want to eat broccoli instead of the goldfish. I'm sure you guys are thinking about these types of things, but tough question. Yeah. yeah. There's been, and you know, actually Penn state has a wonderful history of this, uh, uh, scientist by the name of Leanne Birch. She unfortunately passed away a few years ago, but some of her classic studies um, really, um, really clarified how we form our food preferences. The most important thing is repeated exposure. It's been shown over and over again. Um, the more times that you give an opportunity to try something, the less likely you'll be uh, scared of it. And we probably experienced this in you know our own lives. Mine was you know sushi. The first few times I ate it, you know it was foreign to me. I didn't, I didn't know what I was eating. I was worried I might get sick, but you know, your body, you train your body, uh, over the course of exposure to realize that something is not going to hurt you. And and then you can develop a preference for it. But, you know, there've also been some really interesting studies on, um, you know, can we've actually done some of the, some of this work as well, where you we've used marketing strategies with broccoli um, you know, package it in fun containers and put little uh, slo- slogans and things on it. And we can get kids to increase their broccoli intake that way, but it's short term. And as soon as the intervention's done, you know, we, we have to figure out a way to actually sustain that because, you know, I didn't have kids when I originally did the study, but now, you know, having a child, it's not feasible for <laughs> For some of these, you know, a, a, a busy yeah. parent to be packaging up, not to mention all the waste and, and things that you would have from from excess plastic. But um, but yeah, they, I think using some of those techniques to um, uh, entice children to try the vegetable is important because once they try it repeated times, then we know that we can get them to like it. That's awesome. All right. So let's right, we need to push it better. Spencer, we need to, we need to do better. Well, I, I put it on my, I put it on their plates. They take a little bites and it's just like, oh my gosh, yeah. they'll eat the fruit, but sometimes the green. Beans. Oh yeah. They love, they love, no, they don't eat that. Stuff. I don't know. It's weird. How old are your kids? 
my well, my mine's eleven and eight, and then Spencer's six, are four, and one. Six, the one year old, she'll uh, slam yeah. the, the the broccoli and the green beans, and then the one the six year old who used to love broccoli and green beans, she's just like, no, I won't eat it anymore. I don't know if somebody at school because all of a sudden she's like, ew, gross, and I'm like, you used mm-hmm. to eat this. What are you talking about? Yeah, that same with that same with uh, our guys too, though. Like, the heck is going yeah, on? I don't know. You guys know better than us, but they they must go through some changes and oh. whatnot, but. Well, it's very interesting because right at the time when kids are toddling around, you know, they can all of a sudden, um, you know, are mobile. That's all of a sudden the time you see kids get very picky. And, you know, when they're an infant, you, you they'll eat anything. They'll eat soap. They'll eat random things they're not supposed to eat. But as soon as they become able to, to walk around, they get very picky. And that's thought to be protective if you think about, you know, our hunter-gatherer ancestors. When the baby could wander off from the mother, they could potentially put a poisonous berry in their mouth. And so it's no longer uh, beneficial to just put out anything and everything. Evolution. Look at that. Yeah. Yeah. yeah that's a, that's, that's actually, actually really interesting. Great point. I, <laughs> That makes it yeah, that makes it so that we can understand mm-hmm. whenever we're into that stuff. Very okay. cool. All right, let's get into the research you're doing now because Yash, that's that's you're kind of uh, sent us a few things you guys are working on and, and whatever. Yeah, so um, we're doing two studies: the Apple and Reach study right now. They're both prospective studies in kids. So I'll go through the Apple one first since I uh, help uh, run those. Apple basically is in kids who are four to six, uh, four point five to six years old, actually. And we, it's inspired from a study from Barbara Rolls looking at different forms of food. So we use apple, as you can guess from the apple study. Um, so we have regular apple slices, apple sauce, uh, regular apple juice, and diet apple juice, which is a non nutritive sweetener. The thing with uh, these different forms of apple are that they're matched for grams. So they're all 133 grams. And as, as best as we can for calories, except obviously the diet apple juice is going to have less calories. And the way we give this preload before their test meal is uh, it's given in small sips or small bites across 12 minutes while the kids listen to a story. And this is um, for to delay like gastric emptying, right? Because kids will usually, if they were to drink the whole apple juice or apple slices or whatever it is that they're eating as fast as they can, they might uh, go through it quickly in their stomach. So we kind of control for this by having them take in small bites over 12 minutes. And then after that, we give them the test meal, which consists of foods like common foods that kids eat. So we got mac and cheese, we got broccoli, carrots, so we have some vegetables in there, graham crackers, and, um, and then they get a sippy cup of water. And then they get 30 minutes to eat that. And we kind of, we observe it. So we use a computer and we have uh, wonderful coders who go through the videos and code them for behavior such as bites, uh, latency to first bite, all sorts of things like that. And you know, just observing their behaviors, we want to see our main objective is to see which form of the preload they get hopefully results in less intake at the subsequent test meal. And so far, uh, surprisingly enough, I don't think it matters that much in terms of what they have, except one of the randomization is no preload. So these poor kids reach into a box, right? That's where they get their thing. And sometimes they'll reach in there and there's nothing in there. And like, as a research assistant, I'm just neutral. Like, I'm like, yep, like nothing's in there. And Usually at the subsequent test meal, they'll eat a lot more, um, which, you know, it's interesting because in adults, we, we kind of study this in adults. In adults, the data shows that whole apples uh, seem to decrease energy intake by 15% at the test meal, according to that study. But in kids, we don't know it. And it's important to study in kids because if you're able to, you know, give fruits, um, vegetables, whatever it is before a meal and decrease the energy intake at that meal, Again, it goes back to the energy balance thing, and that would be okay. So, if you're controlling for the energy density, those are that's a lot of apple compared to the apple juice, then, right? Correct. Yes. Yeah, so, or is it, or is it just a small amount of apple juice with a whole apple? Like, is it one apple and like a little bit of juice? They're the same um, volume and grams. Oh, and, and same gram. Okay. So, 133 this, is the gram. so the same amount of stuff but not necessarily the same amount of calories per se the same amount of calories okay. for the for the energetic preloads the same amount of calories the same amount of caloric density and the same same somewhat of the same volume so we sort of structured them to be one of the reasons why they're given in these small doses is so they don't the perceived volume is not a big clue 
And one of the reasons why traditionally people have thought that if you drink your calories, you can get a lot more calories in much more quickly because you bypass a lot of the cells that are sensing the energy and your gastric emptying is much faster with liquids. So when we, one of the reasons we sort of timed the kids and slowed them down is to see, can we, if we control for eating rate, will there be any difference in satiety between the solid and the juice? And what we're finding is that there really isn't. Did they do that with the adults before when they showed no. the difference? Okay. So maybe if figured it out. Yeah. You're saying that that makes in adults, I mean, as we would expect, I mean, yeah, adults who eat an apple versus juice. But they didn't control the eating uh, rate. Right, right. Not in the adult study. Here's a question, Dash. So the you, know, you have the diet apple juice and you have the regular apple juice. And that doesn't make seem to make a much of a difference either when they ultimately then eat their test meal. Yeah, I know you have a paper out the counterpoint <laughs> yeah. about um, like sugar yeah. sweetened beverages versus non nutrient sweeteners. And, you know, for adults, that makes sense because uh, who knows? And it, you know, there could be a lot of a lot going on for adults. But so far, and, you know, you don't want to like make broad generalizations because it is one population in kids specific age range, like at our in our lab. But yeah, like, you know, you get a non nutritive sweetener juice, which is matched for volume compared to regular. And the kids don't really seem to notice a difference of it. And they'll still eat the same uh, roughly on average. So if they have, let's just say 120 calories worth of apple juice mm -hmm. or zero calories worth of diet apple juice, and then they're given a meal that's 400 calories of food, the, the, the kids that eat the, or eat the food with the juice end up with five, over 500 calories. And the kids that Eat, have the diet juice still only have their 400 calories of food and they're all good. Yeah. So, and you know, I, who knows if that's clinically significant because it's a hundred calories over either time, way, but Hey, no. yeah, that, yeah, that up three times a day yeah, over exactly. time. Yeah. I think it is. That's, I think that's an important point for people. But I will say that we were, this gets back to what we we're talking about at the beginning. These studies have been done a lot in children where, you know, you look at two different preloads and one has a, a non-nutritive or diet uh, artificial sweeteners in it and the other one doesn't. And we're talking about mean responses and overall you may not get much difference. But when you actually look at the distribution, there are kids who are regulating very well. Those kids tend to be ones who already are healthy weight. And then there are kids who aren't. And those kids are the ones who are already prone to yeah. obesity. So there's other there's yeah, and that's the thing. And that's what, you know, broad different types of genetics, other things mm -hmm. going on. Right. Yeah. So that's that's part of the key to what interesting. We're so what's the second at. study then? Yeah. The second one is called reach. Uh, Dr. Keller was talking about it just a little bit ago, but it's for resilience to the effect of advertisement in children. And this is the one where we kind of give them uh, different commercials. So you got food commercials, like typical fast food, like Burger King, McDonald's, uh, Wendy's, and then they might get pictures of just toys, um, like to compare to that. And we use the MRI on their second visit to kind of look at structural changes in their brain. They're always going to get a test meal uh, during their visits, and we kind of want to see how much, like, you know, some kids are definitely protected to eating more compared to others. And yeah, so advertisement's a big thing. And as you know, it's all around, it's all around us. You'll be driving anywhere. Yeah. You'll see, you'll see advertisements on the road and it, it's tempting, right? Like even for adults, like you see that you want to get it. And it also goes to the convenience, right? We stratify these kids by socioeconomic status. Uh, I know that's one of the a big risk factor. So it, it all comes down to convenience, right? If you can access food quicker, whether it's fast food, you know, typically energy dense, the parents are most likely going to get that. And the thing with kids is they don't really control what they eat, right? Like they're, they grow up in whatever environment they are and that's what they have to, it's what they kind of get. And, you know, once obesity sets in as the chronic disease, like you guys always talk about, it's, it's hard. Like you can make lifestyle changes, you can do what you want. And like, you know, scientific literacy isn't great across this country. As I know you guys are trying to dispel yeah. that information. Yeah. So Absolutely. It, it's tough. But yeah, we, we're interested yeah. in that. Very cool. Doc, Dr. Keller, what? so what do you do for your kids? I have a boy <laughs> who is eight. Um, he tends to have really good um, ap appetite regulation. So very, very lucky. Um, he doesn't have a huge sweet tooth. He likes, you know, um, 
a few different types of sweets. He's relatively picky. So in our house, um, you can always have fruits and vegetables. Those are an okay thing at any point, even in the middle of the night, if you wake up and you're hungry, you can have fruits and vegetables. Um, and other foods, he, there's, um, there's a negotiation of, uh, you know, in terms of like access to sweets, he gets a sweet treat after dinner every day. And, um, it's sort of expected, but, um, but I am recognized that his, because he has a tendency to be on the thinner side, we don't have a lot of struggles that, you know, some parents have with, with kids who have very high, uh, appetite and, and food drive. So, um, other than his picky eating, we've had a pretty easy, an easy time yeah. of it. Like Carl coming out of the womb, the myostatin genius. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. He, he listens to all of the episodes. <laughs> Every episode. My brother, genius, my brother so has honest. a few genes deleted and <laughs> some, some related to cognitive restraint for certain foods <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> but 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 lucky to have but he yeah, has a guess, yeah, yeah his myostatin gene has been turned off so <laughs> good job though he hasn't gotten fired yet. everyone everyone's out there going what are they the cow about? everybody's seen now that cow that had the myostatin now they're gonna gene. look it up yeah you should look it up he's the cow <laughs> i mine got turned up i, I got <laughs> <laughs> uh, th- uh, anything else you want to add this has been great uh discussion i really appreciate uh showcasing your research because yeah. it's it's interesting to us where you know we're the clinical side of it we don't get to do the bench research so much so uh it's really fun and listening to and i think very appreciated by people listening to this that you know everyone's been a kid everyone has kids and everyone grows up and and then we have these complications and uh, part of it uh, you know to me the conclusion is always kind of yada, yada, yada. It's complicated. And you guys are doing some of the complicated work trying to teach us, you know, how to help people. So we, we appreciate that too. I'll just say your fruits and vegetables don't listen to what the influencers say about like small <laughs> things like, you know, oxalates or sugar. Oh, okay. that's a whole other topic, He's, but you know, if there's oh, one takeaway, man. like eat those foods, uh, fiber is important. So perfect. Yeah. 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 You're a future docs, doc who lifts. Absolutely. We're excited for you. Yep. Congrats yep. on uh, going to med school next year. Thank we you. We look forward to you being our colleague too. Yeah, yeah we're going to miss Yash. And the, I, I, you know, was tempted to try to encourage his his <laughs> research interests, but um, hopefully we'll get a publication before he goes and, um, you know, get, get a, a nice uh, boost before he starts medical school. But we're really grateful to the work you guys are doing to, um, you know, to really talk to the public, which can be about, about this very complex issue. Um, and, um, we feel very fortunate to be able to do the work we're doing because it's a lot of fun to work with kids and to work yeah. with food. It's sort of a, for me, it's a dream job. Well, that's awesome. Very good. Very cool. Thank you so much for coming on. Here's our outro. This podcast is for entertainment and education and information purposes only. Remember, the physicians on this podcast are not your physician. It should not be considered professional or personalized medical advice. It should not be used to replace speaking with your physician or medical professional to discuss your specific health concerns. The topics discussed should not be used solely to diagnose or treat any condition. As a result, we are not responsible for any unwanted medical outcomes. The views and opinions discussed are of those of the host only and do not represent those of any other entities. Thank you.